play Wordle at all? Fun little? Yes, I, I do. I, I avoided it for a while. Not avoided it, that, that's the wrong term, but I I, dev- I saw people sharing their daily results and things and thought, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know if that's for me. And then I tried it one day just out of idle curiosity and I've done it every day since. How about you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I still do it. Um, Have you done today's? Uh, Yes. I always do it in the morning with Tom before he goes off to work. I got today's in three. Oh, I got it in four because I made a really stupid mistake on the third one. Um... But I I mention it because, so, uh, the word Islam is not a recognized word in Wordle Dictionary. Is that so? That's really interesting. (laughs) And another little interesting tidbit, Bible, acceptable. Mm. Torah, Quran, not accepted. Ooh. (laughs) Which Quran spelling did you do? Both. Both. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I, these are the things I do when I can't think of words is I start typing in stuff and going, do you accept this one? Mm. Um, a law also not accepted, but um, I can chalk that up to no, because they also did no like proper names. So I'll give them that one, but they do allow Bible. Yeah. No, I was trying to count how many letters were in Christ, but there are. Yeah. <laughs> Do they do Jesus? I don't know. I should try Jesus. Yeah, you can. T- you can tell I'm uh, a humanity specialist with the way that I was counting my fingers there to see how many <laughs> letters were in Christ and Jesus. <laughs> to be fair, my sister, who's like really, really good at like math and and sciencey stuff, does finger stu- uh, mm. countings and thinkings. And she was at some like math competition and people were making fun of her because she was counting. And I think she did like, she placed like super high because she was like, fuck you guys. Yeah. Wow. But yeah, thought that was interesting. I um, I know that it predates the New York Times takeover, the lack of Islam. Does it? Okay. It does. Because I know that New York Times took out a load of words. Were you playing pre-New York Times? I, I was not. No, neither was I. No. That's um, a, I, I. I feel like I've joined the. Sh- I've joined the ship a little late. I definitely joined a little late. Um, because I have. So I have a game on my phone that's like a, a load of different puzzles that you get a new one each day. And mm. as soon as Wordle became somewhat big, they put a Wordle on theirs. Uh-huh. Um, so I would always just do that one um, instead <laughs> instead you, of the official. Um, have you played Framed? No. They give you six frames from a film, and each fil- uh, each frame becomes a little more obvious as to what the film is. Mm. So if it's a Batman film, for example, the first one would be of a dark sky, and then the sixth one would be of Batman. Um, I- I'm not especially good at that one. But, uh, there's I the... tried Hurdle, which is the yes. music one. Yes, I'm not very good um... at that. I I think the problem with that one is that you either, like, the guess is they either tell you you got it or you didn't. Like, there's no, like, with Wordle you get Mm. the, okay, this is what you're getting close to. We also play Worldle, which is the geography one, where they give you, like, the outline of a country and you're supposed to guess what the country is. But they tell you when you guess one, they say how, like, many kilometers off you are. Um, and the percentage correct, so you can at least be like, oh, that's on the same continent, but maybe over there, and mm. so you can at least figure it out, even if you don't know it, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. the initial one. And then we also play Quirtle, which is where you're doing four Wordles Ooh, yeah, at the same time. You're doing a lot of these. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I played the Sparks Hurdle, uh, and I crush it every single day, because... <laughs> I, I know the because it plays one second of the beginning of a swap song, yeah. and I and I crush it every single day to the point where um, a couple of weeks ago there was a second of silence, and I got it right because I knew a certain song faded in, and Tori said that at that point I'd reached peak anorak. <laughs> but I guess the song from that. But, yeah, the but, first time I tried Hurdle, I got it in one guess because it was an in sync song. Was it? But after that, it was down. <laughs> I'll I'll give Hurdle this uh, for their sense of humor. On April first, their song was "Never Gonna Give You Up" by Rick Astley. Yeah. So uh, I got Rick rolled on that day. So that was good. But I I find Wordle is the sort of thing that I either 
get the word really quickly, like I did today, or I take forever and it's incredibly frustrating because my <laughs> mind just goes blank. And I'm, do you get that? Do you, do you find that sometimes you're just staring at it and you think, or, or do you just yeah, type in words I mean... like Bible and... <laughs> Sometimes I will I I will mess about trying to see if the only dangerous thing about trying things like do they accept Bible and stuff like that as a word is um, that if they do then sometimes it just goes in um, even mm. though you're not trying to, to yes. do that one with Quirtle um, it tells you whether or not it's an accepted word before you hit the okay uh, okay um, it it shows the letter or the word as red if it's uh. not an acceptable word. So I can, for that one, it was a lot easier to see if they had the same Islam thing because I was able mm. to just type it in and it would tell me whether or not. Quirtle also, not Islam, not Quran, either spelling, but does take Bible. I, uh, I think uh, they just probably use the same dictionary. Yeah. I once got into a bit of a heated Scrabble game uh, in which I used a L. Ron Hubbard term from Scientology. <laughs> as one of my words, and it was a particularly high-scoring word. And um, the specialist language in Scientology is often referred to as Scientologies. So I, I guess I used some Scientologies in Scrabble, which resulted in a long conversation between myself and a friend about whether this word should be accepted <laughs> as part of Scrabble, <laughs> because, quote, it's not a real word, or at the very least, it's not an English word. Well, it is an English word because it's used in an English context. Certainly, I would argue that. Um, so, yeah, that, that was an interesting... In the end, we accepted it because um, I think they realised that I wasn't going to budge. <laughs> and I can be very persistent when I want to be. <laughs> I haven't had the opportunity to use super specific like religion terms in I don't really play Scrabble so I haven't been able to use it. Well, funnily enough it was like the that, last but... time I played Scrabble as well. Not because I've been banned from playing it with the people <laughs> that I play with. <laughs> They've forbidden you from touching <laughs> Scrabble. <laughs> but it uh, it does just happen to be the, the the last time I played Scrabble. Well, um I I thought it would be an interesting commentary because we're coming in to talk about Dune and Islam. Um mm. but I I was curious if you had ever uh, I guess you haven't tried typing in Islam yet into. I, I haven't, no, but I, I know not to. Islam know. would be a really good word. There's it would. A one, di there's all different letters. You get two vowels in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Before we get talking about Dune, what's your opening word? So I normally do train. Ah, uh, you're not far um, off mine. I have heard that crane is supposed to be the best one, and so I tried crane a couple of times and it sucked, so I went back to train. <laughs> yeah. I I go with raise, as in you mm. raise me up. That's a that that that's a pretty good one. But there's nothing Fair. more there's nothing more frustrating in the world when you start your wordle game and all the letters come up grey. Well, so I have a second one, because when I do Quirtle, I do two starters. Ah. So that way you get the most letters what's in all your, four. What's your second one? My second one is Plush. Ah, my second one is Lofty. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, still haven't had it on the first go yet, like some people have. No. I, uh, I know Tom it's got it on the first go. Um, back when I was doing, I couldn't, I didn't have a, an opening word yet. Yeah. He did train and got it in the first one. Um, oh. and I got it in two that time. And that's when I started using train as my opening word. So you word. still use, you still use an opening word that you know has come up before. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's not because I think it's going to come up. I just think it's a really useful one. Oh, but it's, so if, if tomorrow's word was raised, for example, I would then try to find a new opening word. Maybe oh, you are just too competitive. I was, I was going to say, am I taking Wordle too seriously here? <laughs> uh, like, it's fun to compete with Tom about it in the morning, but it's still not even that much of a just competition. Just we're... to each other. We, we do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, we're sitting next to each other on the couch and we're like, ooh, this is what I got. Mm. But, yeah, you know. because, because Tori and I know each other's opening words, we have to make sure that we've both done it before we send... The, oh right! Because otherwise, we can kind of tell. I I don't really know his opening word. I don't know if he's really picked one. Um, he used to do a do for a little bit. Oh, oh and so it accepts a do. Get, 
loads of vowels. Yeah. Um, Tori's opening word is Delta, which is a pretty good one. Fair. Yeah, I think he always just does a slightly different one every time, so. This is I just re- can't think of words, so I always have to have the same one. <laughs> this, uh, this is a really good cold open, by the way. I'm I'm glad. Thanks for the the editing note. <laughs> yeah, well, it it certainly tops my Elvis Presley factoids. <laughs> because I'm I'm glad you started this because I was just before we started recording, I was desperately trying to think of a completely useless yeah. pop culture <laughs> fact. We'll try to. Are we now going to have to start with useless facts about the world in order to start with this useless fact being Wordle doesn't accept Islam, Torah, or Quran as words. That is really interesting, though, isn't it? it? I think what's interesting to me is that they accept Bible. Like, if they mm. didn't accept Bible, I'd be able to chalk it up to, like... We're avoiding they're religion. They're all technically proper nouns, or we're going to avoid all religion-y things. But no, they accept Bible. So why why not Torah? Because as we learned in a previous episode, the Torah is just the Jewish, the Jewish Bible. Bible. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's so simple. <laughs> But oh yeah, I find it interesting because I tried both the Q U R A N and the K O R A N, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I spelled that right. Yeah, anyway, yeah, I, I tried both spellings of Quran. Um Islam is not accepted, Torah is not accepted, Bible is accepted. Mm. I'm sure there are others. People let me know because I'd be fascinated. Um if if other people have tried other other words in uh, religious contexts that this, have not been accepted as words. I wonder if it would accept sutra. Oh, I don't know. I'm I'll try d- that just, tomorrow. Yeah. That would be my opening word tomorrow to yeah. see. <laughs> yes, sutra would be an interesting one. All right, I will report back. <laughs> yes, and re- well, report back on this because I'm hoping at least one person will find this conversation as interesting as I do. Because yeah, I'm, I'm I mean, actually... I guess this either is really interesting to a lot of people, or it shows just how boring of people we are. Well, if you're listening to a podcast called the Religion and Popular Culture Podcast, <laughs> I think there's a reasonable <laughs> chance you may find religion-y words being accepted or not accepted in Wordle quite interesting because Wordle I would is be the hot interested. game right now. Well, it's, it's not quite as hot as it once was. It's still reasonably hot. I mean, I would be tempted to, like, contact New York Times and be like, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was just thinking about how they just would never reply to you. Oh, of course not! <laughs> I'm not expecting <laughs> them to, but it would be fun. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll try Sutra. I'll also try to maybe do a little bit of research of finding out what other five letter, four letter, um, five letter, Jesus Christ, five letter words there no, are. No, no, Jesus all... it, uh, could fit, but Christ couldn't. I'll try, I'll try Jesus. Try Jesus. <laughs> I'll try Sutra. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but all Sutra. wouldn't work. That's only four. Uh. <laughs> yes, I think that's the other thing I find quite frustrating with uh, Wordle is I end up realising how many words only have four letters. I know. And uh, there's only so many times you can put S at the end of something. Well, I'll tell you a five-letter word that isn't apparently in the dictionary is Islam. Um, and a four-letter word is Dune. <laughs> a four-letter word is Dune. Is Dune not in a dictionary? It's got to be in some dictionary as the novel by... Also, well, also, do, there's do, there are do, dunes. There are do- <laughs> dunes are a thing, Alan. <laughs> oh god, it's believe- actually kind of why the book is oh, called. Oh, I know. I can't believe that's just gone on record. <laughs> it's. I'm. I'm very tired, folks. Let, let's just put it down to that. Oh gosh, yeah. I was just thinking of the word doom purely in terms of it's the name of the novel. <laughs> oh gosh, that's embarrassing. Okay, let's quickly skate over that. Uh... Doom, the novel slash film. Doing the novel slash film. What are before we get into anything? Um, what are your experiences with Dune, the novel slash film? Uh, I have read two chapters of the novel, um, over a year or so ago. Um, because I have some friends who know that I love sci-fi and so forth, who were mortified when I told them that I hadn't read Dune. They insisted that I did. Um, I read the first couple of chapters. I enjoyed it. Um, but doing what we do for a living. I just had so much reading on and I was just doing so many things that I just kind of... Think, oh, that's what my copy looks like. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I held up a copy. I have the book next to me. Um, So I, I for, 
I put it down and I just didn't go back to it. Not because I didn't like it. I, I enjoyed it, but I just didn't go back to it. And then the film came out and I thought, uh, you know, if I read we the novel... We should specify the, the most recent one with... um Yes. A pretty boy, what's his Timothy name? Timothy Chalamet, is that his name? Yeah, uh, that one. Because there have been other Dune adaptations. Yes, one with Sting, I believe. Of yes. the police fame. Um, so then, yeah, so when they then announced the film, I thought, oh, if I, if I read it now, I'm going to feel like such a poser. Uh, you're really getting an insight uh, into my hipsterish qualities. And I thought, <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, on, on a serious note, yeah, I read two chapters. I enjoyed it. I just had so much reading on at the time that I left it for a bit and just didn't go back to it. And um, then the film came out last October, I believe. And it came out around the same time as Last Night in Soho, and I went to see that instead, because I'm an Edgar Wright fanboy. It's a great film, by the way. Really excellent film. So I didn't see Dune, and I've not seen Dune, because it's now out on Blu-ray and 4K and whatnot. Uh, and I thought, oh, I'll stream it. And then I found out yesterday when we had this conversation, and well, I actually saw it advertised on the side of a bus yesterday, that it's now streaming on Now TV. And I do not have Now TV, so I can't stream it. So I'm hoping that I have a friend who owns it one way or another and I can borrow it off them. Uh, yeah, I was initially planning on, because um, Amazon often has the ability for you to rent digitally for yes. uh, like for like two weeks or something. So I was initially planning on renting it. I can rewatch it because I watched it in the theaters when it first came out. Mm. Um, and then you could watch it and then we could have the discussion. Um, but they they continuously didn't have it up for for renting. You could only buy it. And I was like, I don't know if I really yeah. want to buy which, it. Which is like... a sign that it's selling well. Um, so what about you? Because it, I was... I was quite taken aback when you went to the cinema to see it because as we as we've discussed on this podcast in the past I believe you are not much of a cinema person it takes a lot for you to yes. go to the cinema well I mean it it takes a lot or it takes my husband saying I want to go to the cinema and I say okay um I <laughs> but but that's still on your part you're not really going I don't know if you I would have seen I don't know if I would have seen dune in theaters by myself, but I yeah. probably would have just bought it when it first came on Amazon and I would have just watched it and, and had the digital mm. copy um, just because I'm not much of a cinema person. Um, but I think my husband sometimes likes to go to the cinema. He has read Dune um, as a little bit of insight. Uh, he comes from a family of absolute nerds. So I think reading Dune was probably a necessity growing up. Um, it, although it I was, think he read it relatively recently. It was, it, was, there, but... was it a set text? <laughs> it is. There are many set texts, I think, in that family. Um, and many set watchings. And I haven't watched many of the set watchings, I will be honest. Because as previously stated, not a movie person. Um, but, uh, Dune, Dune was, uh, was a book that he read. I can't remember if I knew him when he was reading it or not, but it was at least early on in our relationship when he was reading it. Mm -hmm. If it was when I knew him. Um, and so when the movie was coming out, he was interested. Um, I was interested. I thought it looked cool. I knew of Dune. I hadn't read it. Still haven't read it. Um, uh, I, it's on my list, but, um, I, so, I think so it's just. chunky book. It's a daunting book to start. It's for yeah. people who have not seen this book. It's like 500. I was flipping through it when you were talking about it and there's appendices and I couldn't find the end of the appendices. Um, yeah. But it was it's like 500 something pages and yes. then appendices at the end of it as well. Yes, it's a chunky piece of work. It's a chunky piece. Um, the movie is the first part of the book. Um, the first book. There, there are like a thousand books in the series for Dune. I, I have heard four that. Main books. I, I mean, I think there's, there's like, there's a couple. I don't know the number. Um, I have heard though that the first one's really the only good one. Um, Ooh, controversial. Yes, I don't know if that is accurate to Dune fanboys, but um, what's the plan it is what these, I have heard, anyway. What's the plan with these films, then? So clearly there will be a second one to complete the first novel. Will they be going beyond I that? I am wondering if there's going to be three for just the first novel. Oh, okay. 
Um, I wasn't, I'm not quite sure where specifically in the novel it ends, because as I said, I haven't read it. I think Tom said it's about a third to a half of the way through. Mm -hmm. But they kind of ended the first movie right when things kind of start to get going. (laughs) Just when things start happening. Which is kind of weird, because it wasn't a boring movie, but I have heard people describe it as a bit boring, and I do get it. Um, It was a lot more politics at the beginning, like politics excitement, which I, I, isn't the most exciting. Uh, I, 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 that's what I like. Like I, I, as I, and I think I've said this on this podcast in the past as well. Like if if you show, you know, when I watch Lord of the Rings, I'm all about stuff like the Council of Elrond more than the Battle of Elm's yeah. Deep, for example. I love. You that might song. like Dune. <laughs> yeah, when, when you said that, I thought, ooh, because I, I, I mean, I liked it. I, yeah. I, because I don't mind that kind of stuff. And there's obviously a bit of actual, like, you know, part of the political intrigue is also betrayal and yes, those kinds yeah. of things that go along with it. Um, so there is a bit of that as well. There's a lot of also kind of setting up what's going on with the main character, Paul. Um, so mm-hmm. for people who don't know Dune, I should probably explain. Um, so Dune is like a sci-fi, speculative sci-fi piece, book, movie, uh, depending on which one you're talking about. Um, and the idea of it is that it's kind of set way in the future and there's space travel. Um, there's kind of these core families that colonize all over mm. the uh, universe. And our main character, Paul, is the prince of one of these uh, families. They get kind of forced to go and colonize this planet called, which I have it written down because this is how much I remember things. It's called Iraqis, Iraqis, um, and, uh, but it's, it's Dune. It's, um, that's the planet dubbed Dune, which is basically just a giant sand thing. Um, but, (laughs) sand thing, it's a planet. It's a big sandy planet. And, um, but it's supposed to be very rich in a particular, um, it's called spice. It's like a, a a natural, Mm. um, formation that kind of is supposed to be on top of the sand that people farm and it powers lots of things. So it kind of is a bit linking into this idea of lots of oil rich things being in sandy, Arabic places. Mm-hmm. Um, the native population of this planet is described as having darker skin than the white characters that are the colonizers coming in. Um, and their religion is described in very um, Arabic Islamic phrasings and there's actually a lot of film as well as the book. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, yes. And I, I, I will get to that in a second. In Sorry, I'm getting book, ahead of things. <laughs> yes. In the book, they actually borrow, Frank Herbert borrows um, Arabic words and words directly from the history of Islam mm-hmm. to use in his text. Uh-huh. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, in the movie, they haven't really dug very deep into the religion yet, which is why I kind of didn't mind doing this episode when we both haven't, I haven't rewatched it and you haven't seen it yet, because I don't think there's as much in the movies yet. There might be more in the next one. Um, but the main character, Paul, is supposed to be, he's, it's a very white savior thing. Um, as, it, it certainly looks <laughs> that way. If you couldn't tell by white colonizers coming to Big Planet yeah. that has, this story has been told many times before. It's a white savior film. It's an old book. It's a very old book. It was written in the 1960s. Um, and the idea is that Paul is a seer. He can mm. see elements of the future. And he also has this ability that is essentially the ability to speak words in such a way that forces people to do those things. Um, which Ooh. again, we will talk about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. but it is, it's a very, it's a very fascinating book in a lot of different aspects, particularly in how it builds the world of the speculative sci-fi future that is present. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the idea of the colonialization and stuff, we would hope doesn't continue into the future, but, you know, people get a people. And uh, <laughs> S- signs as they are aren't good. <laughs> Yeah, I would assume if white people are still around, probably going to happen. Yeah. Um, 
It'll just be phrased slightly differently, I think, than colonization. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it is a bit... Um, there have been a lot of conversations about Islam in Dune, uh, mm. as I am sure would be very uh, o- obvious in the yeah. sense that we're talking about someone borrowing from Islam. The representation is very Muslim. In the movie, the the representation is still very Muslim, I found. They didn't have very much of it. Obviously, all the characters are still brown. They at least got brown actors, um, which, you know, which is a really bad bar. That's a lo- Yeah, that's such a but, low bar. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know yeah. two years ago probably wouldn't have been the case. Um, yeah. So there is that at the very least. And... Um, but the there is a, a part when they first show up, the word has already spread that Paul is potentially uh, this very powerful spiritually figure and people are already on the world um, responding to him when he comes out at the very beginning. And um, the women are dressed in somewhat burqa and that kind mm. of attire, kind of hidden, has just the eye showing. I've seen some they of are this praying in language that sounds very Arabic. Mm-hmm. Um, they are clutching uh, the writing of the world looks very Arabic. So it's so definitely in, trying to evoke. It's still evoking it, a similar it, thing, which obviously yeah. it's it's drawing on the source material. Um, so yes, there is that. Um, but I do want to complicate things a little bit in this mm-hmm. episode, <laughs> um, primarily in a way of painting Frank Herbert in potentially a little bit of a better light in the movie in a much worse light, um, which I, I don't, again, I'm hesitant with the movie because I haven't seen a bigger display of the religion yet, but I did find an interview with one of the screenwriters and i'm gonna paraphrase a bit here but i will quote when there is a direct quote okay um but he said dune's islamic themes were meant to be and i'm quoting exotic which quote doesn't work today where islam is a part of our world Oh, oh, I I will oh, continue. Okay. Hold your thoughts. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So hold your thoughts. Um, the quote continues. Quote: Dipping into Islam in the Arab world was sufficient to make it exotic in the 1960s, but not today. We need to go further to get the exotic element and show transformation. You should need to invent more and borrow less. So. Oh. Um, <laughs> Oh, that's a problematic uh, quotation. Um, yes. So I, I think it would be interesting to start with this quotation because I think what is interesting is taking this quotation in contrast to um, there is a um, an a, there's many appendices in the book the in the first Dune book which I mentioned before and one of the appendices is on the religion in the book. Which I have not read the book, but I've read the appendice on religion, which says a lot about me. <laughs> but I, I find a lot of really interesting things in that appendice that makes a really interesting comparison between Frank Herbert and this particular screenwriter, whose name I wrote down ages ago. I think it is John Spatz, Spates, but anyway. Um. So, let's talk about this quote mm-hmm. okay, <laughs> as well, starters. Okay, well, firstly, I can't believe that this quotation has just come up after we only just mentioned Edward Said and Orientalism last week. Yes, I thought it was a good... As soon as we did that episode, I was like, actually, maybe doing Dune yes. this season would be a really good one. Yes, because you can see so many of the um, core points of Said's Orientalist thesis. In mm-hmm. in just that quotation, so uh, so we'll start with the idea of Islam now being part of our world when it was yes. presumably. Presum- <laughs> I mean, this is the big one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> presumably take take it from that is saying that when Herbert wrote Dune, Islam wasn't a part of our world, which means that 
it either didn't exist at all and was invented after Dune, which is what I, which is not what I think they're saying. But I think they're saying is is that we now live in a multicultural society where they see Muslims and Muslims are part of what they consider their what the world. white experience is, of which world. makes it part of our world, our world. Um, and until then, it's been other. And I think an implicit aspect of this is tying it into 9-11 because that is when a lot of the white experience began to understand Islam Islam as quote a part of our world hmm. um, and that is a <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to it's, it's, a, it's a problem um, because like you say Islam existed in the 1960s it was a very big part of the world in the 1960s. Islam is one of the biggest religions in the world. It is in so many different countries in the world, and not just the Middle East. It is in many, many other countries. It has had a really detailed history. It has impacted a lot of countries that we think of as white countries um, mm. in its history. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to Spain, Alan? I have been to Spain, yes. I'm assuming you have recognized the Islamic influence uh, just by being there. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it, it's really interesting, isn't it? What, what you were saying about 9-11 being like a, almost like a watershed moment. Um, because people did become aware of, say, their Muslim neighbors, for example. Uh, mm. And I think particularly with the need that, you know, sadly, it's no surprise that hate crimes against the Muslim community were, you know, greatly exacerbated by 9-11. Yeah. And just the attempt to combat that alone, you know, making people aware that they live in a multicultural society, that there are people with different beliefs and so on, and that they are not um, e extremists and, and so forth. Um, it, it's... It it certainly says a lot to me about white privilege and the idea of floating through society and not even noticing yeah. other cultures, not even noticing people from different backgrounds, people with different ideas of the world and different practices and so on. Um Oh gosh, it's that that is such an interesting quote, isn't it? It is. Because, because... Um, I, I taught, speaking of that, I, I taught on an Islam course at Durham University for a little bit, um, not because I'm an Islam specialist, but, <laughs> but because literally we didn't have an Islam specialist. Um, and we were, we actually put on the course as a way of trying to show the uni that we needed an Islam specialist. Mm. And then the uni just went, well, now you have the course and you're running it. So why we, should we hire an Islam specialist, which just defeats the purpose entirely. Um, but that's a side note. Mm -hmm. But I was I was teaching on this course and we were talking about, you know, a lot of these kinds of things and Orientalism and racism and, and all of that kind of stuff. And I I have in in Durham University is a wonderful university. I very much enjoyed my time there. I enjoyed teaching there. But it is a very, very, very white uni. Mm -hmm. Very white uni. I think I taught there for four years. And I can count on both of my hands how many students of color I had mm. over the course of about four years. And um, I was sat in this room talking about Islam, surrounded by white students. I am also white. Um, and so I asked them if they had ever been the only person of their skin tone in a room before. Mm. And not one of them was able to raise their hand and say yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, th I think, I've, I mean, I'm assuming you don't have the answer to this, but I'm presuming that this screenwriter we're referring to isn't British. But, I'm assuming. But, I, I don't know. To be honest, I didn't do research on them. I got the quote and was like, well, this is interesting. <laughs> but I find the uh, conversation regarding multiculturalism in the UK really interesting. Um, and the visibility of multiculturalism in the UK, particularly from the um, Blairite government from 19, uh, 1997, mm. um, which promoted the idea of Britain as a multicultural society. And the backlash that has then received 
from uh, particularly right-wing sources, the right of the Conservative Party, for example, and especially with parties like UKIP. Um, but I, I think that emphasis on multiculturalism from a political standpoint, certainly in the UK, made people um, more aware of um, Islam as well. If you're talking about Islam now being part of our world, uh, the certainly in the UK, multiculturalism became a part of political discourse. And it's still quite a common part of political discourse as well. I think so much of the Brexit debate came back to the idea of multiculturalism and the idea of assimilation as well, um, because immigration was a major point in the Brexit debate. Mm. And um, who was coming into the country? Why are they coming into the country? And what backgrounds are they? Do they hold so-called British values? And I put British values in enormous quotation marks because I still don't know what that means. Um, but presumably it's really obvious. Apparently it's really obvious what British values are and we should all hold them. Um, but um, I'm, I'm sorry, I do not know what British values are. Can somebody please enlighten me? Um, presumably it's uh, saluting the Union Jack and singing God Save the Queen while eating a crumpet. Um, <laughs> and uh, th- that's British values. I know I'm being incredibly facetious right now, but my patience with um, uh, British nationalism is uh, <laughs> it, 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 it has run out, to say the least. But um, yes, to, to bring it back to this quotation about Islam, multiculturalism and people from essentially non-white religions um have become more visible in the public domain politically and uh that quotation certainly evoked that idea in me as well that when herbert wrote uh dune he wasn't writing it in a particularly multicultural society or at least the concept of multiculturalism wasn't as widely discussed not as much no yeah. but strangely and this is where i i like to um juxtapose him with our our lovely screenwriter is that uh, as you could probably tell by the kind of conversation about paul and his power with words is that Frank Herbert really believed that words have power mm. and that words are incredibly important. And he really carried that through. There, I, I, I do want to say there are problems with Dune. I don't want to excuse everything that Frank Herbert has done. It is a very white savior. Yeah. It's very exoticism. But you can still contextualize it. But he... And he did. Yeah. He, he had an immense knowledge of Islam and Islamic history and the the complicated um, notions that Islam is not a singular thing, that there are discussions mm. within Islam, mm-hmm. there are arguments within. We've talked about it before, about how religion is discourse and how not every single person under the same umbrella feels exactly the same and that goes not just under bi- other big umbrellas like Sunni and Shia but it's even within those and within those other ones and and it goes all the way down um and he understood that mm. um and when he borrows the phrases and the commentary it is very purposeful and i i there's i grabbed a, quite a few there's a really great blog i will link it in the description of this episode i found it on medium there is somebody who's much more knowledgeable about Islamic history than I am, um, so I will give them the due credit. But they actually went through and um, grabbed loads of quotes from different points in Dune and pointed out exactly how it connects to Islamic theory and Islamic history. Um, and it is, it's much more beautifully done and way more extensive than I think we can do here uh, but I, I did want to give that credit. So some of this is is drawn from that as well as from my own reading of the appendices. Um, but there is this one person who is, it, it's in the history of Dune, so it's a made up history here, that is then quoted by Paul. So Paul does a lot of quoting of older religious leaders as a way of legitimizing. Um, and it, it's a very lengthy quote. I'm cutting out all of it, but it ends with, um, each man is a little war. Mm. Um, how familiar, Alad, are you with jihad? Um, reasonably. But much like you, Vivian, I would not call myself an expert in Islam or Islamic yeah. history, so I would not presume to discuss too much. 
Well, not well, discuss too much, but to <laughs> as, as assume a point of authority. Well, I think jihad is one of those phrases that is is very misunderstood. I don't want to say basic because that sounds really terrible, but it is a very core idea to Islam, where yes. even a, a, a tangential beginning digging into Islam and what Islam really means, you'd come across jihad. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of our listeners might have a particular idea of what jihad means because mm-hmm. of the politicization of yes. Islam that we have been talking about. Yes. But what jihad means for a lot of Muslims is exactly that quote. Mm. Um, so the the definition of Muslim is one who submits to God. And they mean that fully, or to Allah. They mean it, they mean it fully. And they mm. recognize that that is a really hard thing to do. That it is really difficult to be someone who really follows everything by the letter. And they often don't expect you to do everything perfectly all the time. That it is a struggle, and that struggle is jihad. That that struggle within yourself of being the best version of yourself, that war within yourself, that is jihad. Mm -hmm. Um, So I find it really interesting, again, that Frank Herbert is drawing on a really core, important part of Islam. And I mean, the the quote is a bit bigger that really delves into it, but it essentially is explaining exactly that, of, of that concept of you are not the one warring with me. It is me within myself. Um, and of, yeah, and of course here we're finding that challenge of translation as well. The word war in the English language in a Western context yes. evokes <laughs> certain imagery and certain ideas that if you were raised in a Muslim background, for example, it would not. Because yeah. you you are raised to be familiar with the nuances of Jew, of jihad and what jihad is um, for your family and your social context, um, but it's uh, un- unfortunately that that, that does those little nuances don't carry over very well in political discourses. But no, I'm surprised. I'm I'm both surprised and impressed by what you just said. The Frank Herbert, it, because it also <laughs> okay. Oh, right. Okay, the, I'm gonna do. There's the, again. There's quite a lot in in that um, blog post, which I will link. But I'm gonna just draw out one other one, which is that um, there wasn't a, a point in um, the history of Dune, and this is detailed out in the appendix on the religion of Dune. That at one point there was um, a meeting between various religious groups, and they were trying to essentially create one religion for everybody it was a very colonialist um conquering of even religion of this is going to be the cohesive religion across everybody um and one of the arguments that came out was the debate between rationality versus experiential knowledge which is um a big debate in a lot of religions And this is also present in different discussions of Islam. Um, And I'm going to, as I said before, I am not an Islamic specialist. So, uh, and I do not speak Arabic. It's on my list of religions to learn, but at the moment I'm still doing Welsh. Um, And so I don't, I'm not going to be able to pronounce these properly, but it's um, Taklid and it, it to Jihad. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. But basically what that comes down to is the idea of an experiential knowledge versus a rational knowledge. And that these debates are fully played out. And when Herbert was writing about them in Dune, he was drawing from the same arguments of how they're happening in Islam um, and actually drawing from the same scholars. He even uh, sometimes messes up the name purposefully. Cha- slightly changes the names of Islamic scholars and puts them in their his religious book or his his book <laughs> not his religious book but in his book about it and part of it is that he's trying to show that there is a history to Islam so mm. it in Dune it's supposed to be that this is our actual future this isn't a fake world that is in the future not like a Star Wars although Star Wars is in the past um, it's more like a Star Trek than a Star Wars. 
uh, in the sense that it is supposed to be very much based on this is our history. Yes. And um, in it, he's very purposefully showing that Islam has a history, that Islam is a part of our world. And is a very influential part of our world. Mm -hmm. And what is more interesting is that his the presence of it in Dune shows that Frank Herbert saw a future for Islam. Yeah. In a way that I don't think a lot of white writers in the 1960s maybe did. No. No. Well, th that's why I was very surprised. Yeah. Contextually So speaking. I... I thought it might be good to end with our kind of like last discussion, which would be a little bit more on just Islam itself. And we can kind of tie it into Dune a little bit and these discussions of Islam's presence, Islam's history, um, the complicated discussions within Islam. Uh, and that is through um, a, a very important scholar in the study of religion, uh, Talal Asad, who um, is a very difficult read. But if you are interested in religious studies at all, if you're even vaguely interested in, in, in Islamic studies, you should read Talal Asad. Mm -hmm. um, he was one of the very first people to also point out, in a slightly different way than Edward Said, but to point out just how Islam has escaped the attention of religion scholars um, and how much it, our lack of attention on it has really done us a disservice mm. as religious scholars. Um, he really went to town on Clifford Geertz, who is another theorist in the study of religion, who did study Islam. Um, he really went to town really ripping apart Clifford Geertz a lot, but also really applauded Geertz for actually looking at it and, and trying their best. Um, so uh, Talal Asad is definitely someone to read. But he is the one to coin the idea of a discursive tradition. How knowledgeable are you of this aspect of Talal Asad, Alan? Reasonably. I've read, I've read Talal Asad, of course. Okay. Do you want to give I, I, where your is this going? attempt at discursive tradition? Well, we were... <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't prepped on this. I'm so, very sorry, and I also neglected to put them in my notes because I was typing them very hurriedly this morning so, while I was also cooking eggs. Yes, so, so you sprung this on me. So I will defer to you, Vivian, and your preparation. Well, I think it's essentially what we have been talking about for, for many, many episodes, and primarily, um, I think it was our last episode where we talked about the different discourses um, that exist within religion, um, and that's essentially what it is, that Islam is not one thing, mm -hmm. but that Islam is the result of discourse. Not that Islam, Islam, Islams. There are many, many Islams, and there might be as many Islams as there are Muslims in the mm. world. Um, they are in the sense that every person has their own individual understanding of a religion, a deity, a practice. And that in itself could be categorized as its own Islam. Yeah. And the idea being that people are constantly not only being instructed on things, but talking about that instruction and thinking about that instruction and then changing that changing for the next that. instruction. Absolutely, yes. And um, that purely through the fact that happens, we can really see that Islam has a very detailed history mm. because of that aspect of yes. it. Yes. Yes, people deconstruct everything, and they interpret things differently. And um, it even, uh, uh, you, you, you know, I, I don't know if you've thought of this, Vivian, as a writer. I'm, I'm sure you have. But sometimes when you write something, you, you're mindful of the fact that even though you've written something and you think it's perfectly clear, to the reader it may read as something completely different. Yeah. A and that alone. So while there may be instruction in religion... The way that instruction is then received could be different. And then it can be changed because some people may not like certain aspects. They may not feel that certain practices are for them. They may not feel that this belief aligns with their own experiences. They will then change it, as you said, before the next instruction. And then that's where you end up with all of these nuances of lived religion. 
Yeah. And so uh, Assad um, kind of described it as saying that plurality is really like the hallmark of Islam, that mm. it it is for you to have Islam, you have to have this plurality and this discourse and this conversation. And the fact that you have different Islams is what makes Islam Islam. Yes. Yeah, so, the, you know, the history of Islam uh, is... You know, the, the the crucial points of the history of Islam, if you were to read a, say, a beginner's guide, most, more often than not concerns the idea of what Islam is. Mm. And the people involved in those discourses and the influence that they had on the various types of Islam that we have seen emerge uh, over the centuries. But so many of the key points in Islamic history concern the idea of what is Islam. Yeah. And I I, I, <laughs> Sorry, I, mean, I think I... this is a really good point to end on because I think what Frank Herbert really did draw on was that aspect of Islam. He really saw it in a way that I, I to be honest, wasn't expecting um, when I was kind of first starting to dig into things. I knew that there was a lot of controversy around Dune in regards to... Islam and exotic, um, exoticizing the West, uh, the East and the Middle East in particular. Um, I knew it was a white savior text. Um, mm. so going in, knowing some of the problems that it definitely does have, it was surprising to see some of the issues that I don't think it actually has. Mm. I think I was expecting it to be much less knowledgeable mm. of, um, of Islam. And I, I think for anyone who's really interested, I, as I said, I will link that blog post. It's so good. Yeah, that sounds um, excellent. And, and that person really does know what they're talking about. Um, and they actually go in with actual Arabic words as well and showing where Frank Herbert used Arabic words in the proper way that they should be used um, within their proper context. So this guy knew a lot more about Islam than I think our lovely screenwriter at the beginning yes. of this episode knew about Islam. <laughs> yes, As, oh, especially before we do wrap up, the point they made about how certain aspects were exotic uh, and then were no longer exotic, so they had to invent exotic aspects. Yeah. yeah. you know the, the word exotic here simply means unfamiliar to them. So the so now that they are familiar with certain aspects of Islam, they need to presumably because I I don't from that quotation I don't know what they then invented to make it more exotic. I I will be curious to see how it it differs. I will endeavor to read Dune yeah, before the next but, movie comes out so I can properly compare. But what I think what they what they're really talking about isn't whether something's exotic, but whether it's simply familiar to them. And because yeah. maybe they now that they are more aware of um, women wearing a hijab, for example, that element of Dune, as you were saying about the planet being colonized and so on, maybe that element of Dune does not seem as exotic anymore because they're simply aware of I, it. I, what I find interesting, though, is that they clearly needed this exotic element to it. But for Frank Herbert, who clearly knew so much information about islam it that clearly that wasn't un that unfamiliar, unfamiliar. yeah to him. yeah unless of course he still used it in the sense that he knew it would be unfamiliar to much of his readership. i mean potentially yes i i i don't think i appreciate i could be putting words in his mouth there i'm not saying that's the case yes and but... i and i don't want to put words in his mouth in the other direction either because as i said there are other problems with dune and i don't want to forgive everything mm. um but I, I just find it a really interesting conversation point that it's very easy to say, well, this one has, this book has a representation of Islam and it was written in the 1960s by a white dude. It's probably really bad. Um, mm. as, and, as far as books written about uh, featuring elements of Islam in the 1960s by a white dude goes, it's not bad. Is what you it, say. Yes. On, on those standards, it is, it's not as bad as I think a lot of people would expect it to be. And, mm. I am very hesitant about the next movie based on hearing some quotes from the screenwriters who have clearly missed their opportunity of saying, hey, Frank Herbert knew a lot about Islam. Maybe we 
should learn a lot about Islam. Mm. It's, and uh, and understand that there's a history to this religion and therefore there is a future to this religion. And what does that future look like from our angle rather than from the 1960s angle? That would have been a lot more interesting. I always find it quite alarming uh, on, on a similar note when I rewatch Lord of the Rings and which was which came out shortly after 9-11. Mm. Um, or at the very least, the, the, the last two came out um, shortly after 9-11. And in, um, it's either in Two Towers or Return of the King. I can't remember which because I always watch them all in one sitting. So they merge into one in my mind. But the scene where Frodo and Sam are marvelling at the Oliphants. Yeah. And then you see a group of people who are from the region of... It's the Men of the East. The Men of the East, yes. Near Mordor. <laughs> and, you know, they are the essentially the marginalised communities in Middle-earth who have been, quote-unquote, radicalised by Sauron. Uh, so they are now part of Sauron's army. And you, as, you know, as Vivian was saying, the Men of the East, you're probably already picturing what they went for in the films and i I always find that quite alarming because um they didn't need to do those (laughs) because they they essentially made the they they made these men of the east look particularly islamic and certainly geared them literally geared them with weapons and so forth in a way that evoked image of islamic extremism yeah and um and that to me seemed like such a. It it seemed like a film thing more than a Tolkienism. Certainly in the context in which the films appeared. Oh, I I I I, it, I always just find it really whenever I rewatch those films, I find it really uneasy. And it's it's that element that that just popped to my mind there when you said that you were concerned about the second film, and where that could go in terms yeah. of. Um. Yes, I, mean, I I know. I I say you know it's a film thing. I mean a film thing in terms of the imagery, the idea of the men of the east and so on is still in Tolkien's work, and um, <laughs> you know there's some really interesting writing online about how um, many of the people who were drawn to Sauron were marginalised um, by dominant cultures in Middle Earth, and were therefore prone to radicalization just really interesting stuff there i'm going off topic i know yeah we'll but... have to do a separate one on <laughs> yes yes because i'm now i'm now starting to think about how problematic that is but yeah Ooh. i think that was um i'd be interested to re i think i'm going to revisit dune um on this podcast when the next movie comes out but um, I'm a bit late to the punch on this one, but partly because I wasn't really sure how I wanted to approach it. I was going to write a blog post on it, then I was going to do a video essay. Um, but uh, I think I think this is the much better format for it. Mm. Um, and I also think that, you know, like I said, it, it wasn't very heavily present in in that first movie. And it'll be interesting, I think, to compare the way that Frank Herbert understood Islam in comparison to how this film will understand Islam. Mm. And it'll be really interesting to see which one yes, because really bo- understands Islam. <laughs> because both of these versions of this story are emerging in very different environments. Yeah. Uh, not only are they in different mediums, but they are emerging in significantly different environments. Um, and, and that alone is going to impact the way that this is produced. But yeah, it will be just because right now it looks like Frank Herbert's ahead of the game. Right now it does, yeah. I'd be interested to see if it continues to do so. So yeah, yeah um, uh, Islam has a history. It has always been a part of this world for as long as Islam has existed. Uh, just, set, just setting the record straight. Just there. setting the record straight. And it will have a future. It will continue to exist in this Ooh. world for a very long time. Indeed. Um, and, and yeah. So if people want to talk to you about Dune and what movies you should be watching or which books that you should be reading that make you look like a poser, where can they go, Alan? Well, if you would like to recommend something to me that isn't being adapted 
into a film yet, so I can look cool when the inevitable f- film version comes out. You can find me on Twitter at L Thomas. And um, I'm still waiting on a new email address, so I won't give email addresses out yet. Mm. But come and find me on Twitter, and I can give you my current email address. I have tons at the moment. I don't know if you've noticed. But I, I forget which one I'm sending things from. Anyway, yes, come find me on Twitter, and we'll chat there. Yeah, and you can come follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I am at Viviana Simos on both fronts, and you can check out my blog, incidentalmythology.com. Um, and if you want to get in touch with the show more generally, we are uh, on Twitter at RPC underscore pod. And uh, you can also send us um, topic suggestions or your mm. thoughts or anything else to our email address, which is religionpopculturepod at gmail.com. Uh, yeah. Well, until then, have fun wordling and watching Dune. <laughs> yes. If you, if you have now TV, go and watch it. <laughs> I don't know how many of you do have now TV. Let us know if it's any good, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh <laughs> and we'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye folks.